Hello everyone, my name is Katherine Houtman and I am here to welcome you to the CHXD webinar, Designing for Voice UI, Planning and Writing for Voice Interaction. I'm glad you were able to take an hour out of your day and join us. Um, as I said, my name is Katherine Houtman and I am the Director of the Center for Health Experience Design here at MADPOW. Just a little bit about MADPOW and the Center before we get started. So MADPOW is a design agency that leverages strategic design and the psychology of motivation to create innovative experiences and compelling digital solutions that are good for people and good for business. MADPOW a few years ago founded the Center for Health Experience Design, and that's a community over 800 professionals and a range of organizations in the health space. Our partners include fledgling startups and global corporations. The Center for Health Experience Design is focused on collaboration. So what we do is we piece together multi-stakeholder initiatives that are open to everyone and will benefit the greater community. And we also offer membership to accelerate your innovation efforts. So memberships are a very light way to strategically extend your team and bring in niche expertise. We offer access to subject matter experts such as Marley, who will be speaking shortly, MadPow Design Services, discounts on our conference HXD, which is coming in April. We have a whole series of workshops and there's much more. So if you want to learn more, just visit Center HXD to learn all about our upcoming events, workshops, and the membership plan. Just a one more slide before we get started. Um, we are using GoToWebinar for this presentation. Marla will be presenting for about 45 minutes and we plan to spend about 10 minutes answering your questions. All you need to do is enter your questions into the question box in the GoToWebinar interface. If we run out of time, you can email us directly. And yes, we are recording the session and we will be emailing it out immediately um, after. In addition, if you want to, under the handout section of GoToWebinar, you can download the presentation right now. Now let me hand this over to Marley. Hi, everyone. I can see we still have people joining, which is fantastic. Uh, some of you may be here because you were recently at Voice Summit uh, in Newark a few weeks ago. I was there with my first time and it was a phenomenal experience, although it was also a little overwhelming. Uh, Voice Summit is uh, quickly becoming the, the largest, if not already the largest, voice uh, AI conference. And as a result, you get people who are highly on the technical side, you get people who are very much on the design side, you get people like me who are on the content side and user experience side, and some people who uh, are just looking to learn more and break into the field. So one thing that I was really excited about when the Voice Summit offered to advertise and help us let people know that this webinar was going on was this opportunity to dig in a little bit more into how not only the, the large organizations, the Amazons and the Googles out there, are doing their voice AI and, and creating these experience, but also how those of us who maybe are working on slightly smaller budgets or doing maybe working for literally any other company in the world might create an experience that still uses voice as the main form of UI. To that end, I'm hopeful that today will be a bit of an introduction for some of you, um, but also that we'll be able to get into a decent level of actionable elements and, and good takeaways so that you can feel that by the time you leave today, or if you're listening to this later on or sharing it with other people, you will be in a good place to create or improve your own voice experiences. Now, just a couple of ground rules that I'll get started off right off the bat. First of all, since I always get asked about it later and why my, my Twitter handle wasn't, wasn't handy, wasn't there for people to see, I'll just point out now it is right at the top. I am Mars and the Stars on Twitter, and if you have a question or a correction for me or just want to get a conversation started afterwards, you are always welcome to reach out to me. I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Secondly, and I may repeat this once or twice in case some people haven't joined or didn't catch it this time. I am assuming that many of you have phones or other devices that are going to react if I use certain phrases. To that end, 
When I refer to any sort of voice technology, instead of using one that was created by, for example, Amazon or Google or Microsoft, I will be referring to them as Charlie. Now, the reason I do this is that I was recently on a phone call when I was talking about how we could create a voice UI, and every time that the client or I said the magic words, right behind me, my own Charlie began to react and began to respond to me. It was incredibly distracting, and it's a real challenge for any of us who are talking about or listening to videos and audio about these various voice UIs. So, please be aware, all voice UIs will be referred to as Charlie's for now on. Uh, for example, we might say, if you're saying, okay, Charlie, you know what that means. As Catherine said, I work at MadPow. I uh, run our content strategy team. And this is pretty important as to how I got involved in Voice UI in the first place. I, MadPow works in particularly complicated industries like healthcare and finance. And to my mind, the moment that I heard that people were trying to create experiences that worked solely over voice, I thought, oh my God, this is just another complex industry. This is a technology. This is, this is an area where when we talk about this idea of omni-channel experiences that aren't just in brick and mortar stores or aren't just on a website or aren't just in a mobile application, but actually span the internet of things, we're not just talking about a trend. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of potential devices. It's really exciting. And it's really complicated. In fact, right now, we are supposedly at this amazing moment when the voice recognition has gone from a, an extremely high error rate a few years ago, over 25%, meaning one out of every four times that you spoke to your Charlie, it would not understand you, to a low error rate of less than 5%. But a low error rate of less than 5%, that's still almost one out of every 20 times that you are speaking to your device. It's, for example, not uncommon for me to come home and find my husband cooking dinner and talking to our Charlie. And the conversation usually goes something like this. Hey, Charlie, how many minutes are left on the timer? You have no timers set. Hey, Charlie, check the timer. No timer found. Charlie, didn't I have a timer set? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Okay, Charlie, set timer for two more minutes. Timer set for two minutes. 30 seconds go by. Okay, Charlie, how much time is left on the timer? Which timer would you like to check? You have two timers set. Now, this is a situation where to some extent there may have been an issue where, for whatever reason, the phrase that my husband was using, the tenor of his voice in that moment, the, um, the wireless connection, any number of things could have gone wrong. But as a result, over the course of six different requests he made, two of them were understood and three of them were not. There are other days when we ask for volume changes in the music, we ask to play certain songs, we even say things to each other not using the code word Charlie, and our Charlie recognizes what we're asking for immediately, even when we maybe don't want it to. <laughs> so over, over, over the course of time, it averages out to a lower than 5% error rate. But that means that we're really on this UX pyramid. We're barely in the functional realm. We're not really getting to reliable yet. When we're lucky, and that typically means for male voices in places with phenomenal Wi-Fi using the right phrases, in those situations we could say that our voice interfaces are usable that they are consistently reliable and therefore we can, we can trust them and we can use them. But so many people that I've spoken with, so many talks that I've gone to and articles I've read 
are talking about how we can create these significant experiences. There are commercials I've seen where people say goodnight to their Charlies, as though it's a friend or a family member. That's jumping way up to the top of that pyramid. And that means that we're skipping improving our usability and making the experience convenient. And what I want to focus on is how we as designers, technologists, content strategists, content creators, how we can create experiences that actually move up the ladder, that are usable, and that are convenient. And in order to do that, we're going to need to be essentially invisible. We're going to need to take we're going to need to take a page out of the book of people like lighting designers. Now, I love this idea. There's a um, one of the best Broadway lighting designers of the last century is Jean Rosenthal. And among other things, she let the she lit the original West Side Story on Broadway. And she's quoted in several different books. Uh, and she she has this quote that I just love where she says when no one in the audience knows where the light on the stage comes from, and when no one notices anything on the stage except the actors, then you know that you have done your job as it should be done. Essentially what she's saying is, no one should tell us, good job with the lighting design. They should say, I loved that moment when they were looking at the sunset, that sunset was gorgeous. They shouldn't think of it as a lighting design. Similarly, my husband shouldn't be thinking about his experiences and conversations with Charlie. He should be thinking about how much easier it was to cook dinner and how convenient it was to not have to check his phone for the timers or wa and wash off his hands to go do that. It should be the experience of cooking dinner that's easier. And so when we focus on making delightful, significant Charlies so that we are saying goodnight to them, we're focusing on the wrong thing. Put another way, as Thomas Gaynor, the product lead at Spotify, has said, tomorrow's devices should be unobtrusive, something so you that it dissolves into your life. This is tough for some of us to accept, right? Your job is to go unnoticed. I mean, going back as far as 1637, when Descartes said machines will never meet the communicative skills of a human, we've been trying to prove him wrong. And so the moment that we create something that feels significant or that people notice that they say, wow, what a cool technology, that feels like something to say 400 years in the making and we've finally done it, right? And there have been some really cool technological leaps over time. Everything from the first uh, call identification system by IBM, which has now blossomed into essentially what we all use to uh, to help target our phone calls before we speak with, for example, a customer service agent, to toys that recognize what we're saying and maybe even respond to it. There's also things like, obviously, the experience of voice search, which first came out on iPhone and now exists on basically every platform. And in 2016, Microsoft stated that speech recognition systems had reached human parity. I don't think we're quite there yet, but it's an interesting statement to make, and it's certainly a statement that speaks to the impact we are trying to have. In fact, Alexa's speech recently became protected by the First Amendment, and I know I said I wouldn't use any voice UI actual names, so I'm sorry if I turned anybody's on there. What I'm getting at here is we've created an amazing amount of technologies, but not all of them are even things that we would be trying to create. And yet nearly every project I work on and nearly everyone I speak to is trying to do something with voice UI. So maybe at this point we need to, to pare down what exactly we mean. For example, are we talking about just UI that listens? Those are working pretty well. We've got things like um, like Dragon technology, which uh, many people I know use so that they can uh, do sort of speech to text rather than typing. My brother, who has some, some problems with his hands, finds it incredibly valuable, and he used it to get through nursing school. Um, without it, his hands are cramping so badly that he wouldn't have been able to finish his coursework. So from that perspective, we could say, 
pretty much where it needs to be. He still needs to go back and make corrections and changes, but it's in a good place. On the other hand, we've got UI that's intended to listen and respond to us. This is where we get a lot of these programs created by Microsoft, Amazon, Google, etc. There are even robots that are being built to accomplish this. Of course, while I assume some of you may work for those large corporations, for the rest of us, we're not usually trying to build uh, new products. We're not trying to compete with them. What we're doing are typically either chatbots, which technically aren't using voice UI at all, but somehow get thrown into the mix quite frequently in these conversations. Um, these are things like maybe you're using Facebook Messenger or uh, some other previously built or newly built um, typed experience where an automated response is coming that uses typically some form of, of, um, of tree style algorithm. So when you say keywords X, Y, and Z, the, uh, the automated response is then able to provide a, an answer to you. Um, because these respond to trigger words, they're not always built with algorithms, though occasionally they are if it's trying to uh, use machine learning to build on what the initial capabilities were. The AI assistants is the ones that I've been referring to as our Charlies, right? These are the ones that few of us are trying to build competitors to. And so we're not going to spend as much time on that um, other than to use them as a comparison point. The other piece that many of us are creating is skills. And in this example, I've called them out as Alexa skills, but they exist as a sort of app for every single voice product. And these are things that any organization might build. And uh, the key is to get people to know it exists, have them download it to their Charlie, and then speak directly to that skill, to that app, rather than uh, simply speaking to their Charlie. We'll get into a little more detail there in a minute. And again, I just want to reinforce that while maybe you're building the next Jarvis, maybe you're Anakin Skywalker and you actually are creating a robot that can walk and talk and act just like C-3PO, what's more likely is you're one of many, many, many organizations that, or you are one of the people in many, many, many organizations that is trying to reach these very high expectations with minimal technology. And we're not at a great point here. I heard a great talk by Philip Hunter about a year and a half ago where he spoke to what good products can provide us with. He talked about how they need to have a clear purpose. There's a reason that an alarm clock on a phone makes perfect sense. You set it, it wakes you up. It's a clear purpose and it works. Another thing that a good product can provide would be a, a benefit, specifically a non-trivial benefit. So something that reinforces what you already do is not great if I could easily do it somewhere else. But the reason the timer on these Charlies is so popular is that it's something that is hard to do with your hands when you're doing other things. That's a non-trivial issue. Good products also need to be comfortable and they need to have consequences. So using the Charlie to play music, there's a consequence. I get to have music in my home. But using the Charlie to check the weather when my phone is already in my hand and I might just turn on the home screen and the weather's already there, for me, that's less consequential. For some people, it's highly consequential. And then ideally, we're also able to engage emotion but most importantly, there's gratification. We're able to provide what we said we would provide. Which all leads me to the fact that, yet again, as I said earlier, we've got to stop focusing on creating something significant or something delightful. And instead, looking at what makes up a good product, we need to create something that is useful. We need to create things that are intuitive. And we need to create things that feel human. So, with that introduction, I'm going to spend the rest of my time with you today exploring and providing examples and ways that, and, and tips really, and advice 
for how we can make sure that our various interfaces that work with voice alone can be most useful and can become intuitive and can be truly human. We're first going to go through a handful of big picture tips and then I'm going to get into how we create a voice that feels human. For the big picture tips, our overarching goal is to make sure that whether it is a, a chat experience or a voice experience, that those types of what we call overarchingly conversational interfaces do mimic chatting with a real human in a positive way. We want to make sure that we're not just mimicking chatting with a real human in a way that feels comic-y, gimmicky, or off-putting. So our first big tip, as might be expected when we say conversational interfaces, is that this is a conversation. Honestly, even speak, when speaking with uh, copywriters who work with just words on the written page, I like to suggest that people try thinking about things as a conversation. When you create a page on a website, for example, you might think of the headers as the questions that somebody is coming and asking. And then the paragraph or the bullet points or the information that you provide under those headers as your answers. In that way, you can think about the flow of the page being, what do they ask? What do you respond? What does that then prompt them to ask next? And what do we respond? It's even more important, obviously, when we're talking about voice UI. We want to consider both the questions that people are asking and what they mean when they ask those questions. An easy one would be, the question might be, how are you in actual conversation? But that question can mean a million different things. If we're talking about healthcare, then how are you might be looking for an update on a medical condition. If we're getting to know someone, then how are you might be a prompt to finding out about their state of mind or what their mental model for something is. In addition, any kind of conversation needs to use a form of language that we're all going to be familiar with, right? So we need to make sure that we're not using jargon and that the tone is appropriate, that we're not too formal for one situation, that uh, we don't say, oh, our, we're, we're, always, we're always joking and jovial, but actually it's an error message or a serious situation, right? So we need to consider those tones. And one example that I love, even though it's not a voice UI, it actually is written content, is the way that Lemonade has done this. Uh, Lemonade provides insurance, and they've created a conversational interface where they ask a series of questions, and then once they receive the answer, they use that information. So for example, in this first question, where they ask if I'm ready to go, but then in the, um, in, in the form field, they ask for my first and last name, I am able to interpret ready to go as, oh, I can get started immediately. And then as soon as Maya, in this case, has my name, she responds, great to meet you, Marley. That feels friendly, it feels human, and it makes me then more comfortable, remember that was one of our items of a great product, providing my home address, which is her next question. I also immediately see that she's cataloged what my name is and therefore is saving that information, which is useful in this. Big tip number two, say it out loud. Since we can assume that in most cases you're here because you're not building a chatbot, but you are building some form of skill or app, something that is going to have no visual interface, but all voice interface, you're probably going to be building a lot of one-off statements. That can get complicated and confusing really quickly. Uh, I'm going to jump to the second bullet point here, which is that we always want to clarify what the question was in our response. For example, if I ask Charlie what's the capital of Alaska, someday, if Charlie just says Juno, I might know 100% that Charlie understood what I meant and answered the question that I was asking. But today, with that 5% error rate, I have no idea what Charlie heard. I do not trust that if Charlie says Juno, that that is necessarily answering the question I asked. So at least for today's world, we need to make sure that in the answer, we repeat back when they ask, what's the capital of Alaska? We say, the capital of Alaska is Juneau. 
This serves a couple of purposes. It orients the person to where they are without getting into too much detail, right? We're not going getting long-winded. It's still nice and brief. Uh, it also makes sure that if somebody misses the first word out the gate, that they're listening by the time they rehear their question stated and we get to the actual answer. This is also a part of accepting that most conversations with voice AIs at this point are transactional. They're not they're not looking for detailed explanations of the capital of Alaska and the population and where it is in the state and what its significance is. We need to give an opportunity to follow that up, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, one great example of how this is playing in is with vehicle UIs. So when we're working with um, somebody who's driving, they could be a little distracted they can't necessarily, they shouldn't be, looking at what is on their screen. We want them to be able to hear their options. Would you like to call John Smith and allow them to respond back? Yes. And move forward with that. Or if they ask, hey, Charlie, call John Smith, we want to say calling John Smith so that they know that there's nothing they need to correct or anything else they need to do. The other key here with, as I mentioned, very short easy to remember statements, not getting too long-winded, is that it's really hard for people to memorize and remember commands. We're not doing a great job with offering them consistency. For example, here are three, example, here are three different uh, skills that people could download onto Alexa. You could have Pizza Hut, Domino's, and Amazon restaurants. And yet, if you want a pizza from Pizza Hut on, we'll say Charlie, you would say, Charlie, open Pizza Hut, or Charlie, ask Pizza Hut to place an order. Whereas in Domino's, you have to say, open Domino's and place my easy order. And on Amazon restaurants, it's order dinner from Amazon restaurants. These are, these are not all exactly the same framing. And because they're all built by individuals, they didn't necessarily check with what their competition was doing and make sure that they're making it as easy as possible for somebody to switch to them. That really brings us well into our third big tip, which is we can never assume what context somebody has. When you're on a website, you can see the navigation, you can see um, the, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, other headers, you can see images potentially, the, the user flow in general can really guide someone through. But in voice, we have no idea where someone's coming from. And to that end, this is where I was just saying we're going to get into not only thinking about how can we be nice and brief and make sure to answer their question, but what is likely the meaning behind the question. So we see some great examples. Um, uh, that people that they like to throw out in commercials where people are asking what's my credit card balance turn on welcome home what's the nearest bank to me turn on the TV give me my last five transactions those are pretty clear but if somebody's asking something like where's the nearest doctor the chances of them wanting actually the nearest doctor is not nearly as likely as that they're looking for the nearest doctor who takes their insurance and that's something for us to keep in mind, is not to then spill back, as I said, more information than they need, but to make sure that we're setting them up well as though they could see, as well as if they could see what we were talking about. We're essentially, every time we use Voice UI, we're creating something for good accessibility. So when we say, Alexa, sorry, Charlie, where's the nearest doctor? When they say, Charlie, where's the nearest doctor? We might respond, the nearest doctor to you is a half mile away. Do you want to know what insurance they take? We can prompt them. We don't necessarily need to say, to, to just spout off a half mile away, they take the following insurance. No, that's no good because as I said, we need to be brief, we need to be to the point. And we constantly need to be giving our audience something to respond to, and something to engage and interact with us on. And I just said it, accessibility is incredibly important here. Some of the best 
voice UI that I have seen is voice UI that's being created to be more accessible. Uh, voice prompts in place of imagery on a website. Uh, screen readers, to some extent, are our initial accessibility. But now that we're creating things that can only be done with voice, we've got a whole new realm of accessibility to consider. We have to think about the fact that people with different accents often currently have a really hard time being understood. Cultural phrasing can differ. And if your technology is only set up to accept very specific statements, it's not going to pick up on those phrases. We need to be able to understand lists. And when there are situations where someone might get frustrated or overwhelmed, we want to offer them options. Now, I have a, an example that I absolutely love of this, although it is a bit comedic. And I am going to find out, and you are going to find out with me, if we can play it here. that not only can ideally hear someone, ideally understand them, but better yet, can respond with something other than, please repeat that. And we need to be considering what happens if at no point can we understand them. Do they have another option? Now, if you watch all of Bernice Sound's sketch here, they ultimately are just trapped in the elevator forever. And that's pretty scary. And although it is comedy, more and more, the more that we use voice UI as a cool new technology, the more we need to consider these types of alternative experiences. What happens if the voice UI doesn't work? Lastly, in our big tips, is just a reminder that voice UI sounds different. Uh, I looked at fantastic case study from NPR, who they run a radio station. They are audio files. They, everything they do is speaking to us. And yet, voice UI was still different even for them. And the way that they referred to it was actually that it sounded different. When they started approaching voice UI, they realized that the interactions, the conversations that they were having are not the same as when you're speaking to an audience that doesn't respond to you. So they need to think about what features people would value versus what people were used to receiving in a more passive experience like radio. Um, they had to think through things like if they said play planet money, were they making the assumption, if somebody said play planet money, was NPR making the assumption that this meant the latest episode or, did, or was this an opportunity to give them more choices and say, what episode of Planet Money would you like to play? The choice they made was to get people to what they might want faster. This is all very new. There has not been significant testing. There have not been year-long studies where we've been able to create best practices. And so even that, with something like NPR, 
I look forward to hear, seeing their next case study and seeing what their statistics show on how many people continue to listen to the latest episode versus who says, no, give me, what are the last five episodes? Now, before we go into questions, I want to touch on one area that is something I get asked over and over and over again, which is, what about the, the voice itself? For content creators, when we're talking about voice UI, like suddenly we're creating the interfaces. What does that mean for the type of voice and tone we use? Well, that voice and tone can mean should be consistent across all parts of your brand. And as we get into this, I want to talk a little bit about what we mean when we say voice and tone. The voice is like your personality. If your brand, if your organization was a human being, the voice would come across in everything they said. And it never changes. So that voice, once it's determined, is, is used um, in, for every segment, for every audience and in every form of UI, and across every device, and in every medium, and in every channel. It is what says, we are the Charlie makers. Um, and we also make all these other products. The tone, however, that's gonna change. So if my voice as Marley uh, is what identifies me as me, that doesn't mean I speak the same way to my parents that I do to my coworkers that I do uh, to my nieces. It also doesn't mean that I speak the same way when comforting someone in a moment of sadness that I do when celebrating with someone about something exciting. So the tone is likely going to change significantly across different audience segments and in different situations. This is particularly important when we get organizations that say, well, our voice is happy. Well, your voice isn't necessarily always happy, but it should be distinctive in terms of maybe if it tends towards more formality or if it tends towards more casual. It should be consistent in whether it uh, is technology heavy, right? Is it, is it a high-tech sounding voice? It should speak to all sorts of things that are, that are inherent in your organization. There's some great examples out there of um, voice and tone guidelines, and I recommend that every organization create their own. Um, 18F, the uh, government's UX design agency, has um, a voice that speaks to how their tone changes for different types of writing with different intended readerships. And they do a good job of providing examples of each one so that you can see what to do and ideally what not to do. MailChimp was one of the first companies to create their own voice and tone and to publicize it. They actually own voiceandtone.com, and if you go there, you'll see their, well, their newest variation on this. I really liked this particular version, so I screenshotted it, but there are some newer changes. And here, they actually set up their, um, their tone by content type. And so you can see how their tone changes if it's a video tutorial versus a blog versus a newsletter, et cetera. And one thing that they do really well is acknowledge how this works as a conversation. They imagine what the user is thinking or feeling in this moment, what they might have said, so that when MailChimp says something, it feels like a nice response. It feels conversational. This translates really well to voice UI. And when you create your own guidelines, when you create your voice, you're going to start with content goals, and then you're going to create a message architecture, a set of principles, really. You'll define the voice, you'll test it, you'll select the relevant scenarios to create your tones, and then you'll add the nuts and bolts, which are particularly important, important when we're talking about voice UI. So first, those content goals. This is a really interesting thing that I think too many organizations are skipping, because the best thing about content goals is that since we do it for every, we should be doing it for every organization, for every company, for every brand, and it makes us think about our audience, what our audience needs, and what our business objectives are, then it can actually help us decide if we want to be doing anything with voice. 
does Voice UI help our audience reach their goals? When you think about your goals, you should be asking questions like, why did this company get started and what does it want to do? Who are the customers? And what other companies do you admire? Who do you want to be like? You can also ask things like, if your brand were a person, how would you describe them? You can look at different examples. Now, these two slides come from Kate Kiefer Lee, who speaks to creating content for humans um, that was a talk that she gave, and I, but I love these questions. I come back to them time and time again. You can build off of them and expand on them, but it's great to ask these of multiple people across your company, um, both executives and people who are working in the day-to-day -day of customer service and uh, content creation, and understand how people differ in what they think the company is doing. Because ultimately, all of that together will help you align everyone and get good conversations going. That brings us to step two, where we define our message architecture. Now this architecture essentially builds on that, uh, those audience goals and those objectives you have and sets about some principles, some guideposts for future decision making. Whether you're creating designs or content, you should always be able to look at your message architecture and say, does this align with our message architecture? You should be able to look at decisions you're making, for example, creating a new skill or app, and say, does this align with what we said we would do? Your message architecture in a perfect world will solve any argument that ever comes up about where your priorities are or what you should be focusing your time on. It's what will help you identify if Voice UI is right, or if you're already committed, then you can just constantly be checking back in to make sure that the Voice UI will help uphold your, your principles, your pillars. Now, for each of those elements of a message architecture, uh, let's say, for example, um, well, we'll get into an example in a minute, actually. So, for each of those pillars, you want to look at how people will describe you, how, essentially, how you'll know that you have upheld this pillar, and then what it means for the content design implications. I said earlier, maybe you have a, a pillar that says that you are um, uh, very high tech. Well, if that's the case, then the content and design implications may mean that you want to follow the latest trends rather than more classic best practices so that you look high tech. Maybe it means that you want to make sure that you're using Voice UI because that is sort of the latest and greatest. And you, even though it's only uh, 5%, only even though it's 5% error rate, that's still valuable to you because you want to show people that you are on, you are on the forefront of the latest and greatest technology. So our example here is if we say that our company is supportive. Um, then that means we have some thoughts about how people will describe us. Uh, let's say that we are a bill pay organization. But it also means that on the content design side, we need to make sure that our customer support doesn't shut down at 7 p.m. or 10 p.m. or uh, for people who live in certain countries or certain areas or are visiting somewhere else. We need to make sure it's always available. A chatbot might be really important in case it's not financially feasible for us to have coaches available or customer support there. And we need to make sure that anything personalized is explained as to why it is. Now that we've got our message architecture, the next step is to, to start to flesh out what that voice or personality is. What I like to do is think about maybe a list of 20 to 50 different adjectives that align with the message architecture. Um, you can get a group doing this where everybody's writing down the different adjectives that, that they think of. And then, as you start to remove the duplicates and the redundancies and discuss the ones that actually conflict with each other, you'll come up with six to eight that are good descriptors of what you want to sound like. Um, now, one thing that's really interesting here is if you're using, if you are building out an, an app or a skill, Keep in mind that your Charlie has a voice of its own. We don't get to define it. Amazon and Microsoft and Google already have. And so you need to think about, do you want your skill or your app 
to be in that voice or in your own? And yet again, there's no one way to do this yet. There's no best practice. So that's something that you can think about. For each adjective, we're going to flesh that out to really develop the voice in a way that it can be used. Looking at how we do it, what it sounds like when it's written down, what it sounds like for voice, and also examples of what it doesn't sound like. If we say that empathy is a huge part of our voice, it might matter for our bill-paying uh, organization because people think they're being judged. We heard that in user research, let's say. And we do it by expressing an understanding for people's decisions, beliefs, and motivations. It sounds very different written down than in a voice UI. As we said, our voice UI needs to be quick and to the point, right? But there are still ways that we can make that empathetic that aren't just for both. When it comes to testing, a lot of people say, oh, I can't test it because we'd have to build out the whole voice UI. But actually, back in 1983, the, somebody published an idea of a, uh, a Wizard of Oz approach. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this was just invented waiting for voice UI to become a thing. But it's really the idea of testing any system that doesn't exist. Um, what you do is you basically have your moderator, as you would in any testing situation, and you have your participant who's testing the situation, but you also need a person who is acting as the voice. They might be in another room, they might be um, hiding under a desk, they might be face-to-face -face just playing a computer. I don't like that one as much because it's great if the, if the participant can feel as though they're actually speaking to uh, someone that they can't see so that there's no facial cues um, and so, so that there can be no more natural conversation really, more, more what do I want to say, more real life conversation. Um, but it's a great way you can give your, depending on what you're trying to test, you can either give your uh, computer person a script that they cannot deviate from and see how well that works, or you can allow them to bounce around and try to add things and just have your moderator make notes on what they're adding and what is being successful. Once we've tested and ideally updated our voice accordingly, then we can start looking at different scenarios. Um, I like to suggest, at least if nothing else, figuring out what your first interaction sounds like, what bad news situations, be that error message or something as awful as if you're having to deal with uh, medical diagnoses or something, um, congratulations, some sort of help text or explanatory situations, and if it's relevant, things like setting goals. For each tone scenario, make sure that you're considering where this is going to happen. Is somebody, if somebody is going to be using Voice UI, are they in their home or are they in the grocery store? What are the devices that people are likely to use and what medium, what channel, all of those things and what's going on around them? Those may all impact the tone we want to use just as much as how they're feeling. I brought up before this MailChimp example. Um, you know, they really focus on what the user is feeling as well as what the what the what the situation is. Are we on Twitter or in the blog? Is it a video? I think there's this is where there's possibly the most opportunity to delve into how does that change if it's voice versus if it's written down. And lastly. No voice and tone guideline is complete until it considers the editorial elements. This gets to how you can be consistent. And while there's no one set of editorial guidelines for everyone, some of the things that your company will want to consider is, are you writing in first, second, or third person? What grade level is most appropriate? Um, we say that seventh grade is appropriate for most written situations, but there isn't a set guideline for voice. Personally, I've been starting with about a fifth grade reading level, but we haven't done enough testing for me to say that that is definitively best practice. Other things to consider is the punctuation you use, the pronouns. 
that you use for your audience, what kind of slang, abbreviations, whether or not you're using complete sentences, does that change for voice versus written, active versus passive voice, um, possibly even situations where active or passive could be appropriate. Uh, and then I always recommend that you have some examples in place for how you write clearly and concisely. So I know I've thrown a lot at you today, but when it comes down to it, more than anything else, we just want to remember that voice UI is a tool. It is not the magic answer. It is not always appropriate for every scenario, but it is something that we can use and we can use well. We can use to make it intuitive, we can make it useful, and we can make it human. Thank you guys so much for coming today, and I'll pause at this point. Um, Catherine, do we have any questions coming in? Yes, we have questions coming in. Um, I will start on answering those. Um, so just if you have any questions, just put them into the question box, and hopefully we've got about nine minutes, so I hope to get through all of them, and if not, feel free to contact us offline, and we'll be able to get you answered. So in the order in which they were received. Okay, <laughs> first question. What are the best practices when it comes to complementing voice with screen UI? Should it show the text that is spoken or provide more info? That's a great question. Um, it depends. <laughs> when we're talking about things like a glossary or something that's essentially um, reiterating, you know, acting as a screen reader, then reading exactly what's on the, the page would make the most sense. Um, in other situations, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example where there, where you might need additional spoken content. Um, honest, I, yeah, honestly, video captions are a great example. This is a little backwards, but when you think about it, if you watch really good video captioning, if there is background noise happening, they often won't write in the caption the exact words being said. They'll say background conversation. And the reason for that is that when we're reading something at a quick speed that's moving by quickly, what we're looking for is what are we supposed to take from this? And it could be confusing if we're just reading five different conversations happening at once. Whereas when you're hearing it, while some people might listen to every single word, particularly if it's something you've watched multiple times, right? Video you've watched multiple times. At other times, you are just gonna hear the sort of jumbled, oh, there's a bunch of conversations happening. So similarly here, if you have written down um, a, a long paragraph of text, but you think that when it's spoken aloud, it's actually not going to need all that context. For example, maybe it's um, maybe we are talking about something that's downloaded, and um, on the written piece, we need to explain to you that on this page, it's long, but it's okay because you're going to enter your credit card information, you're going to finalize your order, and you're gonna do this, this, and this. If you're doing that through an app or a skill, we don't need to tell you it's a long page. We can just say, we have three questions to, to answer, right? Or we can just say, we are gonna need your credit card information first, but that's not it, right? There are different ways that you can set someone up appropriately. Okay, we've got them flooding in. So let me move to the next question. Um, can you comment on selecting gender of voice? How does the design strategy team think about that choice? Thank you so much for asking that. This is so important. Um, there's been a lot written recently about the fact that the fact that the first um, voice UIs were created in a female voice was actually because it that particular, not even just any female voice, but that particular timbre cut through noise better than other timbres. However, we cannot ignore the social implications of what we do. And once there were multiple voice, female voice UIs being created, it was found that there was an assumption that this voice UI was, um, was going to be female because females should be subservient. And while that may not be true of everyone, I for one am a very firm believer that we need to pay attention to what we intentionally and unintentionally put out into the world. I think it's important to have two, at least two options for a voice, if at all possible, um, and also to consider branching out. No, you don't if you're showing 
uh, medical professionals. You don't always need to have a female doctor just to have female doctors just to point out that we can. But at the same time, why not? Nobody get, thinks twice if they've got a website that shows all male doctors. Why shouldn't we show all female doctors for the next five years until it's normal to have a 50-50 split? So if you're trying to figure out if you've got, um, let's say, a financial application that is extremely authoritative and you're concerned that, and you assume that people would think it should be male, try making it female. Next question, and there's the same person gave two questions and I'm hoping two versions of the same question. Okay. So I'm gonna go with the second one, assuming you clarified what you're asking. So how do you plan tests using the Wizard of Oz approach to make sure you act as closely to your vision of the chatbot without having gone through editorial guidelines? That's a great question. Um, well, for one thing, if if I could have, I should have had like eight more steps in here where test was just after every section. Um, I put editorial guidelines at the end because that is something that doesn't get finalized until the end, but it's something you should be thinking about very early on. Um, certainly you can create a completed draft before you do your Wizard of Oz test. Um, alternatively, you may find in creating the test that you are making some natural choices that will then impact editorial. So put another way, there's two ways that people approach editorial guidelines. One is to say, here's what we've been doing thus far, let's document it. The other is to say, we don't like what we've been doing or everybody's doing something different, so let's create one set. If it's the former, here's what we've been doing thus far, let's just document it, it'll come naturally from Wizard of Oz, you don't have to do anything different, you don't have to think about it in advance. But if you're already noticing that people are being inconsistent, then yes, you should move your um, at least drafts of the editorial guidelines up to happen before the test. All right, I got two more questions in three minutes. Let's see what we can <laughs> so, do. Okay, so next one is, do you have any tips for documenting voice UI responses? Um, I'm gonna have to take that one offline because I'm not sure if you mean documenting how people, what people are saying to it, or documenting all the possible responses of your voice UI, and those are both pretty big questions. Okay, sorry. So I'll reach out to you separately, Andrew. Okay. Oh, he said documenting all the possible responses. Oh. oh he's on it. <laughs> yes. Um, one option is to start small. I, I use Excel sheets, honestly, just to get initial responses down. Um, as it builds, as it, as it builds, you'll need to build a um, database or use some form of management system, content management system, rules engine. There are a ton of different things out there. Um, and it, it, I'm sorry to be so vague, but it, it's gonna depend a lot on, on what technology you're already using and how big this piece that you're building is. Right, so for example, I did work with a client to create um, a, an Alexa skill that we were able to build the entire thing in a series of spreadsheets um, for something that is more of a tree style, you know, diagramming uh, chatbot call and response. You're going to need to put that into some form of database, whether it is an existing CMS or a, a rules engine that you build with a development team. Okay. So last question. Um, so thanks for laying out all these thoughts and ideas. Terrific webinar. Thank so you. obviously medical, but what other industries are actually <laughs> actively pursuing voice? Yeah, I tend to focus on medical both because um, quite a bit of our work at MadPow is in healthcare and it's a passion of mine. Um, and also because it, I, I mentioned earlier, we wanna be focusing on areas where our work has consequence. I would say that most of what I'm seeing is in retail. Um, lots and lots of retail organizations are pursuing voice as a way to interact with them, ask questions. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of um, news publications and media technology in general. Um, you know, I used NPR as one example, but um, CNN, you know, every uh, New York Times, Washington Post, Lots of different organizations in in publication are looking at, I mean, have been using voice again as an accessibility um, situation for, for years and are now looking at how these different 
uh, Charlie's out there can um, pass along the information that they have. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Marley, for such a great webinar. I learned a lot since I'm not a voice UI person, so that I found that riveting. Um, and I hope you did as well. And just in summary, just thank you so much for attending. And just to let you know, both the Center for Health Experience Design and MADPOW are here to help. And we can help you with your design and innovation goals, such as providing research or strategy to augment your team, user experience design and development, service design, intervention design and evaluation, and design and innovation challenges. So as we said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or tweet at Mars in the Stars on Twitter to get in touch with Marley. And thank you so much. And also go check out centerhxd.com slash events for upcoming webinars. And we will be mailing out the video probably tomorrow. So thank you again for your time.